Well, hello, it's great to see everyone. We got a full house today. But let's get going. I got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So my talk is Jesus Loves Little Children, explaining red, yellow, black, and white. And of course, as you all know, this is a hot topic today. Where do all the different people groups come from? And we're going to get into that today and show how science lines up with the Bible and explains all of that. So where do we get this idea of human races? Well, it goes back really to the 1800s to these three characters, Ernst Haeckel, Charles Darwin, and Thomas Huxley. And Ernst Haeckel and Charles Darwin had their own views uh, on how life evolved. And of course, the Darwinian view came to be the most popular. And then Thomas Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. And so he uh, was like Darwin's PR agent and, and promoted everything that Darwin uh, pushed out there in the public. But anyway, as we get this idea of so-called human races from these three evolutionary characters. And in fact, let's look at the title of Darwin's book. It's actually a very long title. When we, when we think of Darwin's original book that sort of changed the landscape uh, of science, we always think, oh, the title was just The Origin of Species, but no, it gets longer by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races <laughs> in the struggle for life. And yes, Darwin was a racist. A lot of modern evolutionists want to cover up that fact, but, but he actually was, and he actually wrote about it in, in his books and his letters. This is a quote from Stephen Jay Gould. He's probably one of the most famous uh, evolutionists of the modern era. And he said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, which was the, the year that Darwin and his contemporaries were pushing, began pushing evolution, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. But let's look at this whole evolutionary uh, concept of where all the human people groups came from. And so evolutionists like to push this idea. It's called the out of Africa hypothesis. And there's all different variations of this hypothesis. But the general idea is that humans evolved in Africa and then they eventually dispersed around the world. And they claim this that the first major dispersal of modern humans out of Africa was about 120,000 to 240,000 years ago. And depending on the guy that's promoting his pet version of this theory, that age may vary a little bit, but that's the general idea. But we have major problems with this out of Africa hypothesis. First of all is the presence of Homo erectus fossils. And basically, Homo erectus is just a version of human. It's just another variant of the human kind. And so where do we find Homo erectus fossils? Well, if you look at these red dots all over the world, you can see a number of them are not in Africa. In fact, here's one in China that was evolutionist dated at 800,000 years ago. So what, what are these uh, characters doing there in China if they supposedly didn't come out of Africa until 120 to 240,000 years. Well, that's called conflicting data, but it gets even worse because here we have uh, human fossils being found on remote islands in the Southeast Pacific 1.7 million years ago, where they obviously had to get there by boat to get there. And so the whole out of Africa hypothesis uh, has a lot of conflicting problems with it that are, that's hard, hard factual data. Now, these are evolutionary years, and I don't, I don't accept these, but anyways, the, the issue is, is that the evolutionists' own data debunks their paradigm. And in fact, this guy, he's not even a creationist, he's an evolutionist, he's a famous science writer, and his name's Bruce R. Fenton, and he actually published this book not too long ago called The Forgotten Exodus, the Into Africa <laughs> Theory of Human Evolution. And so he says, basically, if you look at the data, Humans migrated into Africa, not out of Africa. And so, and that's from an evolutionist. But ultimately, evolutionists think we evolved from apes, and especially from some chimp-like creature. Well, where do you find chimps? Where you only find them in Africa. And you see these areas that are highlighted in orange is where chimpanzees live. 
This is the only place in the world where chimpanzees live, and so evolutionists also leave, believe because we evolved from a chimp-like creature, and because chimps only live in Africa, therefore humans must have evolved there and migrated out of there. But we have a problem with this because recent research has shown that the human genome, human DNA, is not similar to chimps like they originally claimed. Evolutionists need a 99% similarity for humans to evolve from a chimp-like creature three to six million years ago in Africa. But my own research, which I actually published uh, in 2018, where I actually downloaded DNA sequences from the, the, the public databases, compared them to human, I came up with a DNA identity or similarity to chimpanzee between humans and chips of only 84%, and that's a maximum, because that didn't include the areas that I couldn't even match up. So it's probably actually lower than that. Well, what's really interesting is that in 2018, this evolutionist uh, in, in England at the University of London, Queen Mary, did his own research, and he actually used the same data but different algorithms, and he put this up on a blog. He said the percentage of nucleotides, or DNA letters, in the human genome that had one-to-one -one exact matches in the chimpanzee genome was 84.38%. 84%, exactly what I found, only I used a different way to, to go about finding it. So here an evolutionist confirms my data actually the very same year that I published my paper. So this whole out of Africa thing uh, is totally bogus from a DNA perspective, from a fossil perspective, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. And so let's get to the biblical, the biblical version of where humans came from and show you how it fits with science. So what do we, where did humans come from? Well, if you go to Genesis, you have the account of humans being created on the sixth day. So here's Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them in the beginning about 6,000 years ago. Because if we look at the genealogies and the chronologies in Scripture, they give a creation date of humans about 6,000 years ago. And you'll be surprised to know that actually the scientific data fits this timeline. And so in Genesis 3.20, we're told, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, what's unique about women or your mother is that she contributes what's called mitochondrial DNA to, to her offspring. In other words, you don't inherit mitochondrial DNA from your father, you inherit it from your mother. So what, what is mitochondrial DNA? Well, if you were to look at a cell, which I have a picture here, the mitochondria are these little energy factories that are in the, in the cell cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And these little energy factories also have their own little bit of circular DNA. And it's separate from the nuclear DNA or the, the, the genome in your nucleus. And it's about 15,000 bases or DNA letters long. And in fact, there's a creation scientist, um, he got his degree at Harvard, who actually studied human mitochondrial DNA. And he looked at the amount of variation in that DNA, because we've sequenced human mitochondrial DNA from women all over the earth, thousands of women actually, from all over the earth. And we can, we can actually document how much variation there is there. Well, according to evolutionists, if you were to extrapolate 50,000 years back into time, supposedly when modern humans were first kind of emerging, this is how much variation that you would expect. You would expect about 50 DNA letter differences in that 15,000 bases of mitochondrial DNA. So that's what you would expect. Well, what would a creationist expect? Well, we would expect, no, that humans were created less than 10,000 years ago, so we, so we shouldn't see that much. So that's what a creationist would actually expect, is something along those lines. But what do we actually see? We actually see a little bit less than what, the, what a creationist would expect. And of course, that matches up to about 6,000 years ago. 
Unless you think that we're just a bunch of crazy creationists and don't know what we're doing, evolutionists actually came up with the same result. So this was a paper that was published by evolutionists in the journal Nature Genetics, which is a very prestigious uh, genetics journal, and they said this, using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock, and that's how many changes should happen you know, over time, would result in an age of the mitochondrial DNA, and MRCA means most recent common ancestor, or basically the first, the first woman, of only 6,500 years. And that's what the secular scientists said, and so it totally matches with what creationists are discovering. The first human female, Eve, according to scientific data, matches up perfectly with the scriptures in the Bible. Well, let's move on and talk about the DNA in your chromosomes, in the nucleus of your cells. And so you have 46 chromosomes. You have one uh, set of chromosomes from your mother, one from your father. This would be what we call a karyotype. And when cells divide, they get all scrunched up at a certain point in cell division, and then you can actually stain them and photograph them, and that's what they look like. And of course, this would be a, a male genome because it has a X and a Y chromosome. But what does it look like in a living cell? Well, it looks like that. They're all spread out. And so each, each individual chromosome here is colored uh, in a different color to, to show you that what they look like in a real living cell. But what's really interesting is this is a creationist. His name is John Sanford. He used to actually be an evolutionist. He was a professor um, at Cornell University, and he was an evolutionist uh, for much of his life and then became a creationist. But he wrote a book based on a lot of studies he was doing where he was doing theoretical modeling of the human genome and how many how many mutations the human genome would accumulate over time and how many there should be. And he basically wrote a book and called it Genetic Entropy. So in other words, he used the evolutionists' own equations, their own evolutionary statistical paradigms based on human mutation rates and, and how these things should be taken uh, or selected out of the genome over time. And it, it was all theoretical, but he determined basically what we all, most of us know, the human genome is not evolving or getting better over time, it's actually devolving. Or in other words, we're accumulating mutations over time. And what, although Dr. Sanford's uh, research was, was purely uh, theoretical, what's really interesting is that once again, scientific research Hard science backs up what he discovered. And two papers were published in 2012 where they actually sequenced the, the protein coding regions of the human genome from thousands of people. This one paper, it says here, they had 6,500 <laughs> and, and, and five people, people's genomes that they sequenced, but they just looked at those protein coding regions of the genome, which are very... Um, very recalcitrant to being mutated because if you get mutations in these areas, it, it's, it won't result in anything good. In fact, most of these mutations that they tracked were actually associated with heart disease, diabetes, cancer, things like that that are very harmful. And so those would be what we would call rare variants or rare variation. And so they basically, both of these papers used empirical models where they just looked at how fast human populations grow based on what we know from populations all over the earth and how fast they grow. And then they incorporated the, the DNA variation uh, that, they, that they extracted from this DNA sequencing into that empirical model. And this is what they found. They found that human DNA variation based on these harmful mutations only went back 5,100 years ago, and I think the other paper said about 6,000. But anyways, both of the papers basically came up with the same thing, and then they claimed that after that, it flatlined. Well, as creationists, we look at the scriptures and say, man, <laughs> Adam and Eve were created 6,000 years ago. This matches perfectly up with the Bible, and indeed, it does. So once again, science confirms the scriptures. And this makes perfect sense because when we plot out the lifespans of humans after the global flood, which was about 4,000 
300 years ago, starting off with Noah, we see human lifespans begin dropping radically after the flood. And of course, now humans are living probably about 70 to 80 years. And so that's exactly what you would expect if the human genome was devolving and not evolving, or genetic entropy is, is what John Sanford calls it. So that's exactly what we see. Well, let's move on here and, and talk about where do we get all the human people groups uh, coming from. This is a great scripture that the Apostle Paul used when he was preaching the gospel uh, to a bunch of Greeks, and he said, and he has made, or God, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Well, that's interesting because really that word blood really means genetics. That's, that's the way people use it, and we still use it like that today. What do we, when we, we're out buying a new dog breed or something or whatever, what do we say? We talk about bloodlines, right? Uh, when we're talking about close genetic relatives like aunts, uncles, cousins that are genetically related to us, we call them blood relatives. And so all humans are basically of one blood or one bloodline, one line of genetic descent. And so let's look at how that pans out over biblical history. So 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve were created. Then we had a huge event that basically affected our genetics. Um, and so basically Noah's three sons and their wives were the individuals that were used to repopulate the earth. So we call that a, a genetic bottleneck. So what does a genetic bottleneck mean? That means you have this monster, huge population. We don't know how many people were living before the flood, maybe billions. Uh, then all of a sudden, that goes through what we would call a genetic bottleneck, where now only three couples are living through that flood to repopulate the earth. But we have another very interesting feature that also affects where all the modern people groups come from, and that is the Tower of Babel, which is very important, which occurred after the flood, about 300 years after the flood. And the Bible actually gives us a number of scriptures about that that we'll go over. That's where we get the table of nations or about 70 main people groups, which is really interesting because research shows in both languages and genetics that there are roughly about 70 main people groups. And now here we are, 2022, and there's about 8 billion people on the face of the earth. Let's look at some of the scriptures that talk about where all the people groups come from. Here's Genesis 9, 18 through 19. And the sons of Noah that went forth out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan, and these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So these three breeding couples that were Noah's uh, sons and their wives were used to basically repopulate the earth, as the Bible says. And here's another interesting scripture, Genesis 10.32. And these are the families or the people groups, I like to say, of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So the Bible has a lot to say about where all the people groups come from, and which matches perfectly with what we know about genetics. In fact, let's take another look at human genetics here. Let's revisit mitochondrial DNA again. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Uh, this same, uh, the same Harvard geneticist that I, I talked about previously also did another study where he, he looked at all the different mitochondrial genomes, he matched them up against each other, and then put them into this software that built this this tree based on DNA, DNA similarity. And so we see three main branches in this mitochondrial DNA tree. What do you think those correspond to? The three wives of Noah's <laughs> sons, right? So this is amazing. So, so basically the genetic data totally confirms that the earth was repopulated by three women. Now let's look at the Tower of Babel because this is where basically we get all our modern people groups from. Now the whole earth had one, this is Genesis 11, 1 through 9, and I've truncated it here. Now the whole earth had one language, as you all know, everyone after the flood seemed to want to congregate in one place 
and they all had one language, and they all wanted to rebuild their, their pre-flood pagan empire uh, that they had. And so they built this, this Tower of Babel, which we have actually have uh, in our Discovery Center. We think it looked more like a, like a step pyramid. But anyways, so the scripture says, therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So what, hap what do you think would happen if you confused everyone's language? So if you're looking for a, a, a mate, a, a wife, or a husband, <laughs> probably someone you can communicate with, right? Someone you can talk to. So, so immediately, all of a sudden, all of, these, all of these genetic people groups are being broken off because their languages were confused. And we know there was about 70 main language groups. And so human genetic diversity is explained by the Tower of Babel. And I'm just going to share a brief testimony with you. I was, at a, I was visiting a church once on a Sunday night uh, in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I met a guy uh, after the service who actually was a PhD student majoring in Old Testament uh, at a local seminary. And he had no clue where all the human people groups came from. And, and I was, quite frankly, shocked that this guy's majoring in Old Testament and he had no clue. So all of you, when you get out of here, are, <laughs> are going to be smarter than a PhD. <laughs> so anyways, I explained you know, what, what I kn know from creation science and genetics and stuff, and his, his eyes just got big, and he's like, wow, that's awesome. That makes total sense. Well, of course it does. So anyways, let's look. Let's look um, at human diversity. This is a, a current. Uh, estimate of global human diversity, and the most diverse areas are in these green and dark green areas. And so, uh, based on, on the geology and climatology research that creation scientists have done, they've shown that in the upper reaches uh, of the globe that there was an ice age after the flood, and the flood provided perfect conditions uh, to create an ice age. Evolutionists have no clue how an ice age could have even happened, but if you take the global flood model into account, there was an ice age after the flood. And so if the upper half of the earth is, is, kind, of, uh, is kind of cold and inhospitable, so the ark would have landed here, and then the Tower of Babel would have been generally in that same region as well. Where would people have gone? Where would the first major migrations have gone? Well, into Africa and then into uh, the, the area where India is. And that's exactly where we see the most diversity today. And then, of course, people would have eventually migrated all over the earth after that. So what are, let's talk a little bit about the traits that make us all look different. Well, first of all, let's get one thing squared away here, is that human genetics is not, not as simple as we once thought it was. In fact, does one gene equal one trait? I mean, a lot of us have heard that, right, at some point in our lives. Oh, that trait's due to a gene. Well, not, not so simple. But anyways, that whole concept was started by this guy named Gregor Mendel. And he's a, a lot of people call him the father of modern genetics. And he did do a lot of valuable and interesting research. But, I, but in some ways, things uh, were oversimplified by what he did. So he studied pea plants. And so these are flowers from a pea plant. So um, if you took... A true, ble a true breeding line of pea plants that were purple and one that were white, you cross them together, that first generation, you would get all purple plants because the purple trait was dominant. And then the generation after that, you would plant the seed from the F1 generation, and then you would get this segregation in a three to one ratio of three purple flowers to one white flower. And so when you look on the surface, when you look at this, it's like, yeah, yeah, that, well, that makes sense. One gene, one trait. But it's, it's not so simple as we have found out. So I remember when I was in, so take human earlobes, for example. So I remember when I was in high school and our biology professor said, okay, what kind of ear do you have? So, okay, go ahead. I know every one of you wants to touch your ear and see, <laughs> see what you got. So he says, who has recessive and who has dominant uh, ear of this trait. And so the recessive would be the attached earlobe, and then the dominant would be the kind of the dangling 
uh, earlobe, and we'd all look around the room and see if we could come up with a three to one ratio and, and so on and so forth. Well, it turns out that it's, it's not that simple. In fact, this study was recently published in 2017 where they wanted to look at this very simple, supposedly simple earlobe attachment trait and what did they find out. They said, moreover, our meta-analysis, which is just the big, big statistical analysis of, of all the DNA sequences that they looked at, and they had four main groups, revealed a total of 49 significant loci. Well, a loci is just a point on a chromosome. It could be a gene, it could be a regulatory element. But anyways, 49 different places across the genome at least controlled something simple like that, your earlobe. Wow. What about this thing that we call the Asian eye? And as I'm going to show you, that's going to be a misnomer. But it's generally characterized by this thing called the epicanthic fold, which is basically a skin fold of the upper eyelid that covers the, the inner corner of the eye. And of course, we have you know, lots of people groups across Asia that have the, the so-called Asian eye. But there's a problem because when we begin looking across the world, we also see people groups in Africa that have this exact same trait and in Northern Europe. So we have this entire group of people called the, the Swedish Sami. They cover the upper part of Sweden, Finland, Norway, part of Russia, blonde haired, blue eyed, and Asian eyes. <laughs> so anyways, this guy's a famous alpine skier and that's it's a great picture of him there. Anyways, so human traits are not so simple after all. Well, let's look at skin color, which seems to be uh, one of the dominant things people think of when they think of human variation. So what is skin color based on? Well, it's based on the amount of melanin in your skin. So if you have a higher level of melanin, your skin will be darker. Now, believe it or not, this picture that you see here of all these arms are people from across Africa. Remember, what was the most diverse place on Earth? Africa. So where, if you're going to study skin color, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Africa, right? And in fact, that's what they did. So if you look on this map here, they sampled people groups from all over Africa, part of the Middle East and lower uh, Europe. They analyzed the amount of melanin they had in their skin. In fact, it was 1,570 different people that they analyzed, and then they sequenced their DNA. They found that six different genes together accounted for only 30% of the observed skin color variation. Outside of that, there was hundreds of genes controlling skin color. Not a simple trait after all. Very complex. And, as you, and this is interesting because this will sort of underlie the fact of how we get such diversity among humans. Well, this was an interesting uh, case study here. These are two Nigerian parents. They had a baby that was basically <laughs> blonde haired, blonde haired and very light skinned. Well, obviously, these two individuals had in their, their genetic background, you know, some light skinned ancestors. But look what happened. So, when you look at stuff like this, it helps us explain what happened at the Tower of Babel. But let's look at something that, that might be a little bit more common. So here is a couple here. This is a white European lady, blue, blue eyes, very light skin. Her husband uh, is half Jamaican. He has some, some, um, probably some African ancestry in his uh, bloodline. And they had two, uh, they had twins, fraternal twins. And look at, look at the difference. One is, is uh, very light skin, blonde hair, blue eyed, curly hair, and the other, uh, dark skinned, a lot of melanin. So this is, you can easily see how when people groups from the Tower of Babel get their language, or people from the Tower of Babel get their languages confused, and you get all these people groups developing after that, how, how skin color and all these different things uh, can sort out across the world. But what's the evolutionary story for human skin color? And I want to debunk this real quick with a couple of sides. So evolutionists would say, oh, lighter skinned people with less melanin would be selected against in the tropics, uh, but favored at higher latitudes. Which, how many of you have heard that? Well, what about the Inuits that live up at the North Pole and have very, 
very high levels of melanin in their skin. In fact, this science writer wrote this article, Inuits live in very cold climates. Why do they have dark skin? <laughs> because they wanted to live up there. <laughs> they don't care what their skin looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, what about skin cancer? Skin cancer is supposed to be that, that evil mechanism that's selecting against us for skin color, right? Well, when you look at the incidence of melanoma by age, there's hardly any melanoma or skin cancer appearing in people under the age of 40. When are you having children? most of the time, <laughs> under the age of 40, right? <laughs> so how are you going to be selected against if, if there's nothing that's going to hurt you, right? So anyways, and uh, in fact, most people that get skin cancer don't even get it until their 60s and 70s or, or even their 80s. So, so the whole evolutionary story is complete nonsense. But let's talk about something else that, that people love to... Um, uh, <laughs> people love to chat about, and that is this concept of Neanderthals. Who were they? Well, I'm going to tell you they basically were fully human, and you would not even know uh, a Neanderthal unless he came up to you with the spear and is wearing a name tag. <laughs> In fact, we see, we see news stories like this all the time because it's very popular now to dig up Neanderthal skeletons, extract the DNA, and sequence it, and make all kinds of crazy stories. So here's one. Humans bred with this mysterious species more than once, new study shows. Wow, humans breeding with humans. <laughs> Here's another one. Your Neanderthal DNA might actually be doing you some good. Prehistoric hanky-panky between archaic hominids and our ancestors may have helped us survive as modern humans. Here's another one. Ancient humans may have been mothers to some Neanderthals earlier than we thought. So we see these stories popping up all the time in the headlines because it's very popular now, this area of research. So there's a Neanderthal skull. Neanderthals actually had bigger brains than us, and actually some scientists have proposed cloning Neanderthal brains and putting them in modern humans so we can be smarter. So anyways, uh, Neanderthals had larger skulls, but, but the one characteristic thing they had was a sloping forehead and a pronounced brow ridge. And there are some Homo erectus skulls below the Neanderthal skull, and they, the same thing. Remember I told you Homo erectus was basically, they were just humans. Their skulls were smaller, though, but the, in fact, Homo erectus skulls were kind of towards the lower end of the human range, but they were still well within the human range. So what about these features of a sloping forehead and a pronounced Brow ridge. We still see them today. So there's a dentist in South Africa who likes taking pictures of his patients with these so-called archaic traits. I don't know if this guy knew he was getting his picture taken. <laughs> Maybe my video will go up on the, on the internet and I'll get a phone call. I don't know. But anyways, you can see he has a very pronounced brow ridge. And uh, I assure you, he's alive and well. Here are some European rugby players, all with massive brow ridges and sloping foreheads. Here's a famous guy, Nikolai Valuev. He had a sloping forehead and a pronounced brow ridge. He was a famous professional boxer. I think he only lost one match. Now he's a member of the Russian parliament. And I assure you, he's a living and alive and well and a pretty smart guy. But what about this idea of a sagittal crest? And so the arrow there is pointing towards this, this sagittal crest. Some people have these and some don't. But evolutionists claim, oh, that's a primitive trait. Well, the guy up there uh, in the suit and tie there uh, up on the left is a famous neurosurgeon and doing quite well and a very smart guy. And of course, the other guy on the right there, I mean, he pilots a star cruiser across the across the galaxies. I mean, he must be pretty smart. So, but what is this, all this variation anyways between humans? Well, it's not evolution, it's just variation. There's a couple of tennis players, actually the tall guy is, lives in Dallas. <laughs> and anyways, he's five, he's a uh, six foot 10 and the other guy's five foot seven. Anyways, but what really is humankind's greatest problem? Is it diversity? No, it's called sin. So 
Romans 5.12 says, and by the way, this scripture also affirms the fact that we descend back to one breeding couple. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. 1 Corinthians 15.22, for as in Adam all die, even so, in Christ all shall be made alive. And so it doesn't matter where you go across the world or what people group you, know, you might meet or even in the United States, everyone has one major issue and it's called sin. It's not, it's not anything else. So anyways, but thank, uh, thank the good Lord that he made provision by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh to die for our sins and to redeem us. And John 3.16 gives us this famous scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know, I love this scripture because basically this scripture kind of brings, brings everything into perspective when you consider the Tower of Babel. All the people groups were created at the Tower of Babel, but also when we look at Revelations 7, 9, it says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And so, in heaven, there's going to be people from all over the earth, from every people group who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who believed in Jesus Christ and turned their lives over to him, and soon we'll all be in heaven before the throne, worshiping the living God and free from sin. And so anyways, I want to recommend some books here that, that might help you. Uh, I have a book that just came out called Chimps and Humans. It, it is technical, but it, we're fairly technical. I'd say semi-technical. So anyways, I get into every single aspect of this issue that you could think of from a DNA perspective. And so it's... Uh, I think that book will have a, a huge impact on a lot of people, and so that's a good book that just came out. The Design and Complexity of the Cell actually rewrote this book from an earlier edition, so the new edition of this uh, is up to date and really good. And this is a book that all of our scientists contributed to, so we have stuff in here on geology, on paleontology, on genetics, just anything you can imagine, theology of creation. And it's just been updated as well. And so it's a fantastic resource. If you want everything in one place, get this book. And we have our monthly Acts and Facts magazine. It's a beautiful, glossy uh, magazine. That now it used to come out once a month. Now it comes out every two months. And you can sign up and get this uh, for free, delivered to your door. Or you can get an electronic version of it and, and read it uh, on your tablet if you want. So anyways, I would get this. It has... Uh, all kinds of current research and articles in it that, that are really good. So, anyways, that's it, and that's my talk. I want to thank you all so much for, for coming out today.